Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, wow. You guys probably went to bed early last night then. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the Dragon Panel of Dragon Con Tabletop, sponsored by our wonderful friends at Kobold Press this year. <laughs> My name is Abby. I will be your moderator for this fine morning. Um, and with me are some fantastic guests. Oh my gosh. Let's start with Ken. I'm uh, Kenneth Height. I'm a tabletop uh, RPG writer and designer. Um, most recently, and perhaps most prominently, I was lead designer on Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Um, I've written a lot. I counted it up at breakfast today, and I've written all or part of four different bestiaries, so I think maybe that's part of my credit. And uh, for about a decade, I did a column for Steve Jackson called uh, Suppressed Transmissions, in which I discussed all manner of myths, legends, conspiracies, high weirdness, et cetera, which I think is maybe the other reason that I'm on this panel. So that's me. Hi, y'all. I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, or Dr. Z, on the interwebs. Um, I'm the creator, writer, and host of Monstrum for PBS, uh, which is on YouTube's story channel, their Humanities Hub. And I'm actually a monster expert. Uh, that is my official professional title at Arizona State University, where I'm also a professor in the English department. And, and to kick this off, what is each of your favorite dragons? Type or like specific? Character? Either one. Okay. Um, I think that uh, you have to go a long way for me to get a better dragon than the Beowulf dragon. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, basically, if you like Smaug, you like the Beowulf dragon. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm sure that Professor Tolkien would say, yeah, fair cop. Um, <laughs> he's just so cool and so badass and so apocalyptic and everything you want in a dragon and nothing you don't want in a dragon. Um, I just, I feel like other dragons, you know, whatever, man. But yeah. <laughs> the Beowulf dragon is the one. Good choice. Um, I'm a fan of wyverns in general um, with just basically two legs only, but I think my favorite dragon from mythology would be a tie-up between Quetzalcoatl and the moon dragon from ancient Egyptian uh, mythology, which may have been the inspiration for Satan, fun fact. Ooh, uh, yeah. I'll let to pick your brain about that yeah, sometime. Yeah, please. <laughs> so um, I love that you mentioned uh, Quetzalcoatl and the Egyptian moon dragon, because uh, where do dragons come from historically speaking? And I know that's different like culture to culture, but you know, were, were they ever real? Were they always myth? And where did that myth start? Ooh, that's a deep question. Um, in terms of were they ever real, some of them were in terms of their inspiration. Um, there are actual fossils, and fossil record plays a lot into dragons. We can actually trace where there are more deposits of certain kinds of fossils to very strong dragon traditions. So I think that's definitely part of it, especially if we're thinking about wyverns and classical four-legged dragons. Um, in 2015, they actually found the oldest fossil of a snake, and it had four uh, little legs. Uh, so I think that there's definitely some truth to dragons in that sense. Uh, Quetzalcoatl, the Quetzal bird, a uh, beautiful with a big long undulating tail, definitely looks serpentine in the air. So I think that, in my opinion, dragon mythology comes at least in part from real world creatures, both living and no longer with us. Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I think that um, you look at most of the classical eras descriptions of uh, talk about dragons and what you're looking at is some Greek in Egypt who got terrified by a crocodile. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a, a really interesting book by an anthropologist whose name I just looked up on my phone, uh, David Jones, who wrote a book called The Instinct for Dragons. And he has uh, you know, gone and, and done the research, done the hard work. And apparently, you take global surveys, and about 39% of children have a fear of snakes. And this is true in places that don't have any snakes, and it's true in places that are lousy with snakes. So Australian kids and uh, Ellesmere Island kids, Eskimo kids, all have fears of snakes. And so the notion that he says is that this is literally an instinct, like animals have instincts, that human, the human animal back when we were evolving in Central Africa, had a very strong instinct to stay the hell away from snakes. And his argument is that other things that were uh, uh, going after our uh, uh, 
proto-human ancestors included giant birds, mm -hmm. um, you know, vultures uh, especially, and uh, lions. And if you combine those three instinctual fears, you get a pretty good average of a dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the sort of the, 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 the hard, uh, uh, the hard case for dragons that his theory solves is Scandinavia, which as we know loves dragons, mm -hmm. was nuts for dragons, has no large fossils, mm -hmm. and has no snakes or crocodiles while we're on the topic. And so um, for Scandinavia to have gone so crazy for dragons implies that there has to be some switch in your brain that just wants to set itself to dragons equals yes. <laughs> and um, uh, you can, uh, go along the notion that what Scandinavia does have is an awful lot of volcanic vents. Mm -hmm. And if you see, you know, steam and fire bursting up out of the ground and you say, what's down there? And someone says, that's a big snake. That's a dragon. Everyone's like, well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Right? So, you know, um, I, dragons are too big, I think, to have one origin story. Okay. And I For think, sure. you know, fossils and crocodiles and moray eels in the Pacific Ocean, which can grow to 25 feet long, the biggest ones. Um, lightning, uh, mm -hmm. you know, chain and ball lightning is what Chinese dragons basically are diagrams of, uh, if you look at them. And uh, volcanic vents, I think all of those become dragons because I think David Jones, and again, it's anthropology, so soups on of, of salt. But, you know, that is a remarkably strong correlation all across human populations to have a fear of snakes. And I think there may actually be a switch in you that says, stay away. But when it's really yeah. big and has wings, I don't know, maybe, maybe yes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe yes. I think it's a good point you bring up about the volcanic vents, um, that fire-breathing dragons only exist in Western European um, mythology mm -hmm. because of natural gas deposits and volcanic activity. So again, that's interesting how certain traits of different dragons are geographically uh, traceable. Which yeah. Is fascinating. yeah, there's a mountain in southern Turkey, which would have been Greek at the time in Lycia, uh, called Chimera. Yeah. And because it has natural gas vents all mm -hmm. over it. And so whether the mountain is what the monster was named after or whether the you know, other way around, yeah. <laughs> you can, there's a very clear connection between a natural gas vent and a fire breathing uh, monster with a serpentine part and a lion part and also a goat part because the Greeks were and The goat parts, the not. fire breathing part, right, yeah, which right, I love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the Chinese dragons have the head of a camel. So we're not, mm -hmm. we're not you know, in love with reptiles necessarily. Yeah. I do love the idea of like, a fainting goat dragon. Yes, <laughs> that's a cheat. Someone needs to put that in their game because that is that's, that's my next BBEG for yes. sure. Um, so with with the like dragons are too large to have one origin story. Obviously, they represent different things in the stories they are in. So like mythologically speaking, and also part of like the human psyche, what does that represent about us and the stories we tell? In my opinion, this I think that our affinity for dragons, part of it might be a uh, horror of evolution, but I think also there's this idea that, for me, dragons represent nature untamed to a certain degree. Um, not, like you're saying, with their predator features, but they are so inherently elemental in different ways. And I think that we're attracted to that and we're scared of that. And that I think we see a lot of people being friends with dragons or using dragons as like steeds or mounts um, as being part of our desire to tame nature um, and try to take it under our control because nature is uncontrollable in so many ways. But that's just my theory. Yeah, I think that the domesticated dragon emerges about the same time as the friendly fairy does in mm -hmm. English literature. Mm -hmm. Because before Shakespeare, fairies were terrible and you oh, didn't yeah. want them around. Um, but by Shakespeare's time, enough people lived in cities and didn't have to worry about their cows getting a murrin or the you know, uh, elf shot taking the, the horse that they could start you know, making up fun stories about the fairies. And I think that the domestication of the dragon is the same sort of response. It's we've domesticated nature, we've tamed it, mm -hmm. we've got water wheels, we've got you know um, uh, turbines, whatever else. And so we feel like we can own a dragon and, and make mm -hmm. it a pet in a way that I don't think that the Beowulf author yeah. would have believed you could do. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's such a good point. I mean, that's what we did with wolves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's an extension. And, and even yeah. in ancient China, where dragons are much more positive, mm -hmm. it was still sort of the emperor's prerogative mm -hmm. to deal with the dragon. If you were just Joe Chinese peasant, mm -hmm. you also did not really want a dragon around. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> um, and uh, 
I think personally that the positive attitudes of the dragon in Chinese legend mm -hmm. are an example of a sort of an ongoing, I don't want to use the word propaganda, but I will use the word, um, uh, uh, you know, a PR campaign mm. by the Chinese emperors because they very, very early, I mean, uh, maybe even as early as uh, the Jin Dynasty, mm -hmm. are identifying the emperor with the dragon mm -hmm. because he's the lord of nature and he you know, has the mandate of heaven and controls whether it rains. And once you've said the emperor is the dragon, you suddenly can't have a lot of stories about dragons going berserk and killing everybody mm -hmm. because that sends a, a mixed message, even though the emperors certainly did that, um, maybe especially because. And so I really feel like uh, because China's been literate so long, mm. and all the scribes are basically working at one remove or other from the emperor, that they are told in no uncertain terms only positive dragon stories. So you get some PR there in a way that you don't with the Greeks or the Norse or other dragon cultures. Yeah, I also think we have to take the spiritual practices into consideration there as well, um, because even before the Jin Dynasty and the Golden Dragon and the whole literally the first emperor was supposed to be like half dragon, half human kind of situation. Um, I think that this idea, and that's why the Chinese dragon is made of all different animals, mm -hmm. um, of just the different way of viewing nature and how those animals all had different representations and importance um, in the spiritual practices of ancient China. So I think that for me, Chinese dragons, part of that, they've always been benevolent to a degree, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting. And I think for me, we can trace that not just to the emperor, but also to older spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. and, and from those points of, you know, okay, now we can make sure our animals are going to be fine. So we're not worried about the dragons coming and snatching them. Um, and now we can turn them into maybe pets. Yeah. Has that changed in the last 50 to 100 years? Ooh. And where are we with dragons now? I mean, we're we're in the golden age of pet dragonry. Um, <laughs> you know, we've got. Can I get um, a, a pocket uh, dragon, a little teacup I mean, dragon? You've got how to tame your dragon. You've got Pern. You've got uh, you know a Khaleesi, God bless her. Mm -hmm. You've got all of these <laughs> characters yeah. whose fundamental quality is their dragon taming, and it's only gotten bigger. I mean, I grew up in the '70s, and you know, we called the shelf in the science fiction section pornography because <laughs> there was just so much of it. And, you know, if I'd known then that it would be doubled and quadrupled and cubed and squared, you know, we, we are uh, ever farther from a, a fearful relationship with nature one way or the other. And maybe global warming will convince us the dragons are actually bad again. But for, for the time being, we are in a golden age of, of my pet dragon, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that you hit the nail on the head there with, despite the effects of humanity on the world in so many different ways, I think that this golden age of dragons, as you're calling it, definitely emerges when we feel like we have more control over nature. Um, and I think, though, that part of us is attracted to dragons because we don't want to have that control, like deep down. Uh, but maybe that's me being idealistic. I, I think that there's, there, there's a degree of sort of, you know, the, you know, the old gothic bad boy right mm -hmm. that you you know he's he's your lover but he's mean yeah. um and you can yeah. tame him if you're jane yeah. Eyre. oh god yeah the and, ironic and, hero. and i feel oh, like yeah. and i and i feel like there is there is an element of that with our relationship with dragons mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um that it is a only i am you know pure enough good enough cute enough to tame a dragon uh but he would be mean you know khaleesi yeah. is another great example of that that you know dragons are awful if you're westeros but they're nice if you're dothraki yeah and I'm trying not to go off onto like a romantic literature tangent right, right now. Yeah. So thank you. But, <laughs> but, but again, I, I feel like that, that urge, that sort of um, yearning for the bad boy is, it, 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 it was done best and, and, and loudest maybe in the romantic era, but it goes all the way back. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I could talk about, with you about this mm -hmm. for forever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, don't even get me started about Byronic heroes and serial killers. Mm -hmm. So about there. Byronic heroes and serial killers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, Serial killing dragon, free idea for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, that does that does lead really, really well into this next question, which is why dragons? Because like centaurs in mm -hmm. their oldest mythologies are horrific, and we have chimeras and you know serial killers, like you say. So why is it dragons that kind of occupy this pinnacle of fantasy, baddie or cutie, or both? Because I'm, uh, I'm trying to find a good way to say this. So centaurs were at 
inherently rapists. I mean, that's uh, like yes. their <laughs> defining characteristic, at least initially. And I think that I'm not even going to tip. I'm not going to get into some of the stuff that's about dragons these days. Let's put it that way. Um, but I do think that they're so non-human um, in a way that's very powerful and attractive that's different than a chimera because a chimera you know that it doesn't make sense like we have a snake part and a lion part and a goat part and they're all clumped together and it's scary but I think like Kenneth was saying this idea that there's dragon is real enough to things that our ancestors have that we still have today on earth that I think that it makes it easier to story tell when we have that familiarity to a degree I mean yeah I think that if you you, if you discount David Jones's notion that we're all hardwired to worry about dragons, and that's why, I think that you do have a sort of a notion where dragons can mean enough things to fit into every story, mm -hmm. and res and sem and uh, symbolize enough things to mm -hmm. fit into every story. And then uh, give a shout out to good old Christianity, yeah. which weaponized the dragon as the symbol of uh, Saint George, baby. Of the devil. Yeah. Saint George. I mean, literally from Revelation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he's talking about a, a great beast with you know rising out of the sea, mm -hmm. and it's not not a hop, skip, and a jump to a dragon because this is Saint George is Christian Perseus. I I hope this is not news <laughs> to anyone, but Saint George is Christian Perseus, and. Um, uh, and so the notion of the dragon as the great enemy mm. had, again, I talk about the Chinese propaganda. Well, we have now the church doing propaganda for, against dragons for uh, 2,000 years to a greater or lesser extent. And I think in the West, uh, that is a big part of why dragons are in, our, uh, in the top uh, shelf of our closet is because for 1,500 years, people would sit in church and look at the sculpture of a dragon or the stained glass window of a dragon or whatever and hopefully be told not to have dealings with him because he's, you know, a dragon. Mm -hmm. The propaganda part is a really interesting note to consider because even just with heraldry um, and when the dragon became disassociated with the devil to some degree, I mean, it was something iconic um, to look up to. And of course, why would your house not want to be associated with a dragon right. um, at a certain degree? And I think that maybe we all still want to be associated with the dragon mm -hmm. and that level of power. I think is attractive. So this, I've got a two-parter question here and they, they really feed well to each other. So the, well, I've seen Christian art of the serpent of the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. just being a snake with wings and that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Is there a point where the dragon grew legs or the, I guess the serpent grew legs in this scenario? And then what is the difference between, you mentioned wyverns earlier, mm -hmm. what's the difference between wyverns, dragons, worms, and their varying? I think that there are five different types of dragons. That's how I classify them. So you have serpentine, which has no limbs, might have wings. So biblical Satan with just the wings and the snake would be a serpentine dragon. Um, you have wyverns, which have two wings and two legs or no legs. Um, nope, two legs, two legs and two wings. <laughs> then you have a classical dragon, which is where we see more emerge in the medieval period and heraldry with four legs um, and two wings. And then you have sky dragons, which would be just wings, but not different from serpentine dragons. That those ones might be in the water or on ground, but mm -hmm. these ones are just sky, like celestial dragons. Um, is that four or five? I think I lost. Count. I think that's four. That's four. I can't remember the fifth one off the top of my head, but maybe you can help me out. Um, it's my own classification. Not sure I can help yeah. you with your taxonomy, <laughs> um, but uh, we, we uh, so we got um, uh, winged snakes, we've got uh, wyverns, we've got classical dragons, we've got celestial dragons. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, Drake's is one, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, there we are. There you go. Someone has read the monster manual more recently than me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that uh, in in terms of the various types of dragons, a lot of it is just what either fits the thing that you thought you saw in the well at Lambton, and mm -hmm. everyone's like, well, that, that didn't have legs, so it must have been a worm, um, but we know it's a dragon, mm -hmm. versus what looks good on the shield of whales, mm -hmm. um, uh, versus True. what is, uh, you know, how recently did the person who drew this dragon see a crocodile? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think you have sort of a, a, a real fluidity to it, and it, the, the taxonomy is something that I think Victorians did first. I don't think even... That sounds Victorian. I mean, heralds had to sort of identify wyvern versus dragon uh -huh. just because they had to draw it with the right number of legs. Yeah. But heralds were always understood to be people doing this recondite thing that had no real, you know, no real connection mm -hmm. to the observed universe. 
And so, you know, arguing about what, how many legs a dragon has or what a dragon specifically looks like, I think doesn't really begin until, again, we're so deep into domesticating them that we yeah. can argue about them. Because even the 17th really century uh, printings of the Roman bestiaries that talk about dragons just illustrated them any old how. They didn't, yeah. like, break it out and have a fight amongst themselves. I like to think that they did, but maybe that's the <laughs> <laughs> capital R. Well, they kept it out of print is, I yeah. guess, all yeah. I can say. This one um, looks scary enough. I don't know. Right. It looks kind of cute. And my fifth one that just came up would be the yeah. Chinese dragon, actually, because it's so different from other ones. But now I'm going to have to add a sixth with the drink, so thank you for that point. Yeah. And, and what was the first part of your question? It was, uh, when when did the, the biblical Satan with just wings sprout legs? Right. Well, if you look in the book of Genesis, the snake began with legs, mm -hmm. and he had them took away. So, um, uh, so he didn't sprout when did legs. He, when did he regenerate his legs? According to Genesis, he, he, he lost them. And then I think that he gets the legs back uh, once enough medieval travelers have seen crocodiles and elephants and hippos and things and said, everything scary has four legs, get with the program. I, I love that you mentioned hippos. Yeah. I would also think that uh, cultural communication would come into play too, um, of being exposed to different cultures and different countries' ideas of the dragon probably influenced also the amount of legs or no legs yeah, that they it, had. Mm -hmm. it, it may just be, you know, uh, the, the classical dragon, the Greeks are very loose on does it have legs or does it not have legs. <laughs> But by the time you get to Pliny, and uh, certainly by Isidore of Seville's commentaries on Pliny, mm -hmm. you definitely have a sense that dragons have legs. Mm -hmm. And so it's really how, you know, how literate was your clergy when you were drawing that mm -hmm. dragon? Yeah, that's a good point. I think maybe most critically is they have teeth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with that, um, we we're going to open it up for Q&A. So if we want to just line up at this mic here in the center, and we'll just go from there. Um, since since that's a little narrow, we'll just go ahead and start with you, and then oh, okay. go from there. Yeah. Oh. Is it turned on? I hope so. Hi there. It is uh, it's turned, not, not on. turned on. I'm, I think the guy in the booth is going to have to do it. Try it now. Okay. Hey. Okay. Yes. You got it. Okay. So first off, I want to say um, love Vampire the Masquerade. Oh, thank you. Um, I had a friend of mine just passed away this year Sorry about that. who used to be an accountant there. Well, 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 I, well, I don't know if you knew Charles Bailey or not. No, no, I know. But, but yeah, I brought Charles with me. Okay. I have some of his ashes with me. So, so we went Miss Dragon Con this year. Well, that's, that's good <laughs> to know that he <laughs> keeps the street going. <laughs> um, but it, you, here's, here's the thing. Okay. My favorite, now I was born Year of the Dragon and a Taurus, mm -hmm. and so I have, when you brought up the uh, centaur, mm -hmm. I was going like, that's one of my favorite ones too. <laughs> and so I've had, my favorite dragons had always been ones that were kind. And that had a lot to do with my upbringing with watching H.R. Puffin stuff. <laughs> Oh yeah, and in fact, we've got Marty Croft here. It's just fantastic. <laughs> and also, um, later when I went to Disney and saw Figment, oh my gosh, what a great dragon! Um, but I wanted to find out what your opinion was, uh, both of you, on this particular dragon from Never Ending Story, Falcor the Luck Dragon. That's what I was trying to find out what you thought about him. Mm -hmm. Opinions on Falcor, the I think dragon. just heavily influenced by Chinese mythology for sure would be the most obvious. Um, and why not make dragons fluffy? I think I it makes them cute. Yeah. <laughs> like a little, and everybody thought he looked like a dog anyway. Yeah. And you scratch behind his ears and you got all excited. Which I would say would probably be back to my argument about trying to tame nature, right? So it's even more dog like and therefore more tameable or easy for us to sort of conceptualize as being able to tame, I guess. And there and there may have been a, a combination of the dragon and the foo dog when mm -hmm. they're making him up really since they've got yeah. sort of a Chinese dragon, as you say, and mm -hmm. then you go for the lucky foo dog and now we have a new wonderful furry marketable dragon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks guys. Thank you. Okay, um, hello. Um, I'm wondering about like uh, sort of a lot of 
more modern dragons are able to shapeshift. Is that like something that has like, what's sort of the origin of that really? Chinese dragon. To my knowledge, they're the only ones that originally could shapeshift. Um, depending on how you count Tiamat. Valid. Um, Tiamat is a creature of chaos and can take a lot of forms and spawn a lot of monsters. And so you could argue that Tiamat is the direct ancestress of the Greek Echidna, who is the mother of monsters, and is very variably described. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so the possibility is that the Greeks or the Babylonians would have understood uh, their dragon, their ore dragon, or at least one of their ore dragons, as a, as a dragon of chaos that can change shape and take on different forms. But I don't think in any case anyone thought that Echidna or Tiamat turned into a person. I think they just turned into different sorts of monsters. I would agree and disagree with that. Um, I do consider Tiamat to be mother of all monsters, um, and I think that we can trace so many monsters back to her. But initially, in the original Babylonian mythology, she didn't really have a form. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, but there's it was written in the text that all of creation was housed in her womb. So I would make an argument that she was humanoid-ish. But again, we don't know because mm -hmm. she was also salt water. Right. So she did yeah. a lot of things. So actually, I like that theory that, yeah, yeah. maybe Tiamat and her shape-shifting or lack of defined form might contribute to the shape-shifting dragon. But, but, I, but, I, but I figured that most of it, yeah, Loki, who is, you know, both evil and a shape-shifter is, mm -hmm. you know, he's prime dragon territory. But I, I feel like a lot of it is just the need to depict dragons um, uh, uh, to depict dragons on uh, TV and in the movies uh, cheaply. Um. That's also a good point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm running a campaign that's loosely based on uh, Naomi Novik's Temeraire series, Ugh. which is Regency era uh, dragon riders as a third branch of it's, the British military. Yes. Um, are there any resources for non-European dragons? I've only been finding like you know the classic chromatic metallic gemstone dragons, but I'd love to populate my world with Chinese dragons mm -hmm. and South American dragons and you know feathered Quetzal dragons and stuff like that. Do you have any? I mean, I don't know. A, I mean, I yeah. I did not um, uh, carry my bibliography with me. Um, there are definitely books. Um, there is a. A weighty scholarly tome from the turn of the century called The Dragon in China and Japan, mm -hmm. which may or may not be what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, stat blocks. Um, <laughs> is there a, uh, well, the trouble with that is that uh, the good people at Wizards have been bitten on the hand over their cultural appropriation and other nonsense. And so they are probably in no tearing hurry to make an Oriel Oriental Adventures 5e probably for good reason. Um, so in terms of stat blocks for various uh, 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 non-Western dragons, I feel like uh, if you can't find it somewhere in the bowels of the internet, your best bet is to just reskin whichever dragon you think they should be as badass as, and then um, add uh, you know, power to make lightning or power to um, uh, increase the crops or power mm -hmm. to um, uh, uh, come back and destroy Aztec civilization or whatever it is you want your... <laughs> Your, your dragon to be able to do. Uh, hello, my question is also about Naomi Novik's work as it happens. Um, but like her portrayal of dragons is very interesting to me because they're not nature personified or power personified. They're like, like working class schmucks like the rest of us. I was wondering if there were any other portrayals of that kind of thing or where that might come from, like talking about that kind of subject where dragons are like more mundane. Mm. Yeah. I'm racking my brain for folklore and mythology right now, and I can't think of any where dragons are more mundane. I mean, the sort of, uh, the, the closest you get in mythology is something like the adder cop, which is a, a sort of a fairy that turns from a snake to a person mm. and are generally problem children. Um, but in terms of what Naomi Novik is doing, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, uh, what I think she's doing is trying to present uh, dragons as more characters from uh, Aubrey and Maturin. Um, and that most of the sailors in Aubrey and Maturin are working class, ergo her dragons should be working class. 
Um, also, it may be that that's her political sympathies and she wants us to root for the dragons because we are, as I mentioned, in the golden age of tame dragons. Um, so I would probably just describe this to Naomi Novik being a, a fun and interesting writer more than Naomi Novik going and researching legends about the Adder Cop of all goddamn things. <laughs> So what's your take on people becoming dragons, like in the case of Fafner from Norse mythology? Personal opinion, or? <laughs> <laughs> Personal opinion, or where you think yeah. it comes from, or what you think it might represent? Ooh, that's a hard. Three-prong question. I mean, I think it comes from wish fulfillment. Yeah. And I think it's just, you know, I want to have the power of volcanoes and crocodiles and a dragon. Um, but I know that it's sinful to want that, so I'm going to have the mm -hmm. bad guy do it. Mm -hmm. um, also, Fafner specifically um, becomes a dragon because he basically uh, is corrupted by the Rheingold. And mm -hmm. so that's what leads him into it. And the notion of the dragon as the embodiment of corruption, again, is thanks to our good friends in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and as, you know, uh, personal advice, don't become a dragon, is my personal <laughs> advice. Uh, at the very least, you won't be able to fit through doors. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you have problems, you can read uh, uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where poor Edmund becomes a dragon and he doesn't like it at all. Yeah. I think the corruption's a good point, and I think that when people become dragons, um, it's about power again and wanting to have the power of the dragon for either nef usually nefarious reasons mm -hmm. uh, yeah that'd be my interpretation hi so you already started to go into this with your different classifications mm -hmm. of dragons but with so many different takes on dragons across so many different cultures what core attributes do they have to have to be considered a dragon I would say serpentine yep at the core, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Longer than they are wide. <laughs> yeah, longer than they're wide. I like yeah. that. Um, I think that they have to uh, partake of some elemental power. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right to identify that elementality as a fundamental. Mm -hmm. So storm, fire, uh, ocean, mm -hmm. a, a river at, at yeah. weakest. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like they have to have that. And they have to be ferocious and powerful. Mm -hmm. um, you, you see the depictions of St. George killing a dragon, and the dragon looks like basically a large dog he's yeah. so tiny um i don't i mean i would not want to fight a dog-sized dragon let me be clear but i feel like a proper dragon has to be you know a big threat that mm -hmm. you you don't have a two hit dice dragon that you fight yeah. that's that's a troglodyte and you can fight those all day yeah. um given that we're in the golden age of pet dragons <laughs> and that many up and coming or current fantasy authors probably played D and D when they were younger. What do you think the effect of Dungeons and Dragons is on our current trend of fantasy interacting with dragons? I hate to say insurmountable, um, but I mean pernicious. D &D, yeah, D and D obviously has had influence not just on dragons but on many different uh, monsters' portrayal, uh, and I think for sometimes good often as as a folklore sometimes I get frustrated to be quite honest about um, the differences but that's just me wanting to be a historicist at my right. core. How, how, how dare modern folk mess up folklore right <laughs> um, I mean I don't uh, I don't read a lot of secondary world fantasy because most of it is god-awful so I really can't speak to what god-awful fantasy writers are doing with d and I'm sure something god-awful um, <laughs> In my experience, the sort of uh, the, the the very very few authors that I do read are taking maybe some aspects of D and D. The notion of um, you know dragons as tactical combat. I'm pretty sure Naomi Novik must have played a bunch of D and D back in the day, but I don't really feel like they're depending primarily on Gary and Dave's dragons versus you know Beowulf or uh, Saint George or whoever. Yeah, I think it's an example of a monster that has such deep-rooted history, like thousands and thousands of years of it. Yeah, you can't just boil it down to one text or one bestiary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just as a thing for the folks looking for Novak stat blocks, uh, you can look for the old Scion books. Uh, they had stat blocks for the South American dragon gods as well as the Chinese and Japanese dragon gods. Um, 
But my question was, um, so we talked about, you know, golden age of domesticating dragons, but all the way back into the 80s, Shadowrun had where the dragons were basically domesticating people, where they had erupted from the earth, sixth world, everything had gone friggin' bonkers, and now they're CEOs, in one case, one of them got elected to be president of the United States, and they're, like, one of the three rules of Shadowrun is never make a deal with the dragon, because it's gonna screw you over. So, like, where do you, like, I don't, I feel like that sort of pre, like, prescient, I mean, not prescient, because we knew in the 80s that fossil fuels were gonna eventually burn us down, but that that sort of looking at the dragon becoming evil again, and hopefully if Catalyst stops screwing up the system, maybe. <laughs> but any opinions on that? I mean, the, the Shadowrun dragons are, uh, part, part of it is just structural. You need a big bad uh, to make a fantasy world work. Um, and for those who don't know, Shadowrun is a world in which the magic uh, fantasy creatures uh, all emerge into our world sometime in the nebulous future, and now orcs and elves are all running around being cyberpunk. Um, and dragons are the bad guys. I like to think, and I have no, I mean, I'm friends with a ton of the Shadowrun writers, but we have never sat down and uh, uh, discussed the origin of, um, what was his name? Dunkles on, thank you. Um, but I like to think that it was them going to the Chinese dragon who represented the emperor and saying, but we know the emperor is corrupt and awful. How do we do that? And uh, the notion of dragons, you know, that sort of heterodynes with the Catholic dragon as the embodiment of sin and corruption. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're looking to embody sin and corruption, I don't think that saying, you know, um, uh, 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 corporate overlords and the presidency are where you should not look. Um, and it certainly makes for a, a fun and vibrant story, especially in the cyberpunk assumption that the, that the system is inherently evil and you must rebel against it to be a virtuous member of society. So I think all of those trends, you know, put together, you know, with, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the Wisemans and uh, uh, Jill Lucas and Steve Kenson, and they all just sort of said, yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that vibes. And that's how, you know, real sort of creative work happens is that you are, you're not just saying, I'm going to copy you know, one dragon, you say, I'm going to think about what dragons can do in my world, and then I'm going to draw on these uh, uh, areas of folklore or whatever to reinforce it. Mm -hmm. I'm unfamiliar with the series, but that seems like yeah. an excellent interpretation. If we can keep the Q&A per person to about two minutes, we can get through everybody. Oh. All right, mine is, I'm going to say very uh, nerdy, I think it's a good format for that, but given some of the vast morphological differences between dragons, you know, given like the the uh, East Asian lung, the South American Quetzalcoatl, my personal favorite, the Bonacon, which is a reptilian cow that shoots flaming poop at people. Wow. Haven't heard of it, but... Hungarian myth, by the way. Yeah. Fun stuff. Uh, do you think it's... Po uh, what do you think about the possibility that uh, dragons are just uh, a kingdom of their own, like how there are different kinds of dinosaurs, but they're not all the same mm. species, even though they get lumped together under dinosaur. Do you mean in terms of reality or in fiction? Either or. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. <laughs> I mean, I think that they're definitely their own, you know, uh, of, like dinosaurs, which are yeah. both therapsids and the other one that isn't therapsids. Uh, I, I think that there's no problem saying that dragons are whatever you call dinosaurs. Yeah, they yeah. definitely have their own taxonomy for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, clearly we even have differences in all of you with what the taxonomy should be. So mm -hmm. there is yeah some room for wiggle room yeah. there. I, I, while we're talking about um, quasi realistic dragons, I do want to plug a book by Peter Davidson called The Flight of Dragons, which is an amazing. I mean, Peter Davidson has written some of the best mystery stories ever, and he's also a great children's author. But his Flight of Dragons book is a straight-faced, well, we know that dragons existed, how does that happen? Mm. And he sort of builds out a remarkably in-the-moment convincing story, which I don't really want to spoil, even though it's nonfiction. Um, but hunt it down, look it up. If, if we get you know, time, I'll talk about it later, but I don't want to use up my, my two minutes. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, we've talked a lot about how dragons are influenced by like more ancient things like uh, the Chinese emperor or the Roman Catholic Church, etc. But given that mythology changes with us, do you see a trend going with dragons now of like 
you see dragons being more identified with a particular idea mm. or um, way of life, as it were? Uh, for me, a little bit, especially considering some of the big ones like Harry Potter and Game of Thrones, and at least bigger and more mainstream pop culture, I think it's a fetishization of the past. Um, keep in mind that I feel like a lot of these texts often um, have dragons situated in different times um, that are cool to like fantasize about, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, it's when you're inside, it's hard to say, you know, uh, yeah. de definitively the dragon that's going to be remembered 500 years from now is the Westeros dragon mm -hmm. and not uh, how to tame your dragon. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that you're exactly right that you combine domesticity and fantasy and you've got 99% yeah. of modern dragons. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, the father of a dragon lover uh, sitting back there. And my question is that how dragons are stories in mythology that were passed on about danger and fear, mm -hmm. and it incited fear and, and danger amongst populations. I can see dragons today in, in certain uh, maybe metaphorical um, instances being present that, that as a parent, I could pass on those stories of fear. So uh, what's, what's you guys' interpretation as far as being a parent and speaking about dragons and, and not having fear regarding dragons? That's a great question. Um, I could tell you right now that I have a dragon mobile hanging over my baby's crib. Um, and I approach dragons from the perspective, at least with my child, um, as protector. Um, we always say like the dragon's gonna protect you in your sleep and keep your sleep space safe. So I think for me, it's about at least very young age, making it more about protection and ha pow harnessing power is something that can be helpful to us. And I guess respecting the power in the same degree. I think if um, I would ask the question, how many snakes, how many dangerous snakes are in the backyard of my house? I live in Arizona, so there's a lot. Right. Uh -huh. and yeah. So I might not be saying dragons will protect yeah. you if I lived in Arizona. Um, in Chicago, it's like, yeah, dragons protect you all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and if you get out of line, they burn your city down. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, Kids are, are great. Just tell them they're cool dinosaurs, and you know that'll be 99% of the job. Uh, I, I don't think that parents need to make kids fascinated with dinosaurs or dragons. Mm -mm. I think that's 99% of parenting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll also chime in here. Um, so my sibling is outside and works for Penguin Young Readers, and they've got a lot of very cute dragon children's books. Like I think it's like Dragon Loves Tacos. Um, oh, yeah, they've that. got like bleach blonde hair, and they're in a blue skirt if you want to go talk to them about dragon books. They've got some suggestions for you. Casey Dell Press is another really good one that does um, cute interpretations of monsters, including like Chupacabra and Banshee and well, cool. yeah. Krampus. Our, our kids are not ready. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll go out in the wilds and be eaten. <laughs> so what are your interpretations or thoughts on dragons combined with other like fantasy elements such as zombies or robots? Oh. Mm. Uh, the first when I think of dragon and robot, I think Mecha Godzilla. Um, so for me, there's like a history there, um, I guess. But why not is kind of my first reaction. Why not? I mean, the Dracolich is a master bad guy in your D and D game. Uh, it's super annoying. Everyone hates it. Um, so you know, in in the privacy of your own home or your own gaming table, yeah, yeah having bacon on bacon, there's nothing wrong with that. Knock yourself out. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is, if, say, dragons were real, mm -hmm. even in fantasy, how would breath elements work? Mm. Like, I've read a lot of dragon books, and, <laughs> like, Wings of Fire, and Harry Potter, and all those, mm -hmm. and they never really talk about how these dragons can spit flames, or mm -hmm. acid, or freezing death breath. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't cover acid and freezing death breath, although plenty of real things spit acid, including you. Um, uh, I mean, you humans, not you personally. I'm sure you're very well mannered. But um, uh, I, since I plugged Peter Davidson already, I'll plug him again. Uh, he says that uh, dragons generate methane. Uh, and there's a perfectly simple biological process for a, bi a living creature, even a reptile, to generate methane, and that he has um, uh, gizzard stones, oh. like a bird or a crocodile, 
and that they strike sparks and that gets rid of his methane. And so the breath weapon is sort of a, a, a big belch for a dragon. Um, and again, uh, for dragons that blow frost or, or, or whatever else, you've got to have to talk to somebody else. But Peter Davidson, I think, has solved the fire question. Um, if you're interested in that too, there's a great book called The Science of Monsters. Um, and I can't remember the name of the author, but he gets into how at least the fire could hypothetically work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, you never explained anything about the drakes on the dragon side. Like, what are those anyways? Well, I just learned about them today, um, to be honest. So, yep, with my friend back there. Um, so I can't answer that with any authority. Um, if a drake is defined, um, first of all, let's just be honest and say that even the Greeks did not really know the difference between Draco and, mm. any, and Dracon. They used those terms indistinguishably to mean things with legs, things without legs, big snakes, real proper dragons, who can say? Um, so just to be clear that all of this is pretend, a wingless, fire-breathing sauropod, uh, if you're calling that a drake as opposed to a dinosaur that breathes fire, which would seem to be the natural thing to call it, um, I would say that uh, they would be probably more likely those are the ones, frankly, that I would uh, use the, the Peter Davidson explanation. They live in swamps. They eat a lot of swamp uh, vegetation. They build up methane. They blow it out through their gizzard stones. I would make drakes almost the most natural of the dragons because uh, the flight is, although Peter Davidson does it, flight is a tougher road to hoe, especially yeah. with those little bat wings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back to Beowulf's Bane, so one of the things that everyone forgets is it's not the fire breathing or, or the massive hole in his neck that kills Beowulf, it's the deadly dragon venom. But that's basically the last time we ever see deadly dragon venom, even though it's got a long and storied history. Uh, thoughts on when that got phased out and why that got phased out and how that got phased out? Um, dragon venom being deadly is probably a drift from the basilisk. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, who had famously deadly venom, and you would kill the basilisk uh, with your spear, and then the venom would travel back mm -hmm. down the spear and kill you. Um, now, getting basilisks and dragons mixed up happens a lot. It happened in Roman Chronicles, where they are, literally there is a record of a legion that goes into Libya and kills a dragon. Mm -hmm. And then they say, and so many, so many of our guys died of poison because they got poison on them. What that actually means, make up your own story. I can make up many. But um, the notion of a, uh, of, of a dragon emitting poison is in the medieval bestiaries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, Isidore of Seville, it's all the medieval bestiaries after him. And I really think that it's the uh, early modern era when they start doing, you know, um, uh, those, that, that, that first batch of of, um, uh, of, of trying to sort of sort dragons and basilisks out and saying only one of these can have the poisonous uh, blood, get it straight. Um, but, you know, way back in the old days, um, uh, dragon's blood used to uh, be congealed, and that's why you have dragon's blood resin. And you would use that in the sort of like cures like as a poison cure. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should. Uh, personal thoughts, or maybe just ideas. On, uh, yeah, catch. <laughs> ideas on how we got to the point, especially with um, more recently within the last couple of decades, uh, media depicting dragons versus dragons themselves. Mm -hmm. Like maybe books like Dragons in Our Mist, or movies like Dragon Heart. Like, do you think maybe that could have come from people seeing a clash of uh, ancient cultures, like how you're talking about? Asian cultures viewing dragons with a positive view or European with a more negative view. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think maybe that could have stemmed from that? I think that's a great theory for sure. I think it definitely seems possible for me from what I know in terms of historically there were no dragons ever fought each other. Every now and again, you'd get, you know, the notion that the, I, the, the closest that I can come, and maybe this is not an all audiences answer, <laughs> is that uh, in uh, England at least, and I think other places in medieval Europe, people believed that in the summer, dragons would uh, mate, uh, and the exudation of their mating would drop into the wells and poison it, and that's why you shouldn't drink from the well in the summer. And that was really 
just, you know, don't yeah, get the plague, up. kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was connected to the Perseid meteor shower, probably. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that, you know, if you've ever seen two animals going at it, you can not always tell what they're doing. Um, so I would say probably, though, in the modern era, dragons fighting is a legacy of Toho Studios and kaiju fights, yeah. not yeah. of anything uh, mythical or uh, famous or cool. I mean, not the Toho Studios isn't cool. Yeah. God forbid. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. The, the red dragon and the white dragon underneath uh, the castle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. In um, literature and media, tropes are kind of important and bred into stories. Um, revolving dragons, what is your least favorite and most favorite trope? Ooh. That's a great question. I think about At that. the risk of causing a stir. Yeah. <laughs> I think my favorite would be when the dragon is, and this is just how I approach monsters in general, is actually benevolent or helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's why I think the Chinese dragon history is so fascinating in a lot of ways, because they could be both um, and kind of mysterious. That'd probably be my favorite trope. I think that my favorite trope is just the, you know, breathing fire and mm. turning everything around it to ash. Um, as bad as the last couple of seasons of Game of Thrones were, mm -hmm. You just got that visceral, lovely shots of the dragons just ripping the hell out of all those armies. That was just... Doing what dragons do now. Yeah, right. Right in my veins, and I love it. What um, a difference in answers. Yeah. <laughs> the two genders, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think my least favorite speaking in Game of Thrones would actually be dragon taming. Yeah. Because of how I see dragons and as like this personification of elements in nature, mm -hmm. I think in some ways it makes me sad yeah. when they're tamed. Yeah. And my least favorite is the special one who can only who's the only person who can talk to dragons or whatever. No, that's just yeah. annoying on a million different levels. <laughs> yeah. Be a special person who can talk to cats. That's special yeah. enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I wanted to bring up how we were talking about there's a bunch of different types of dragons, yes. how, like some with two legs and two wings, like mm -hmm. the drakes I mentioned, all that sort of thing. And then I want to come back to Drake, um, Draco or lich dragons. <laughs> um, I think it'd be really interesting if um, Draco liches were explored upon in those different like areas of dragons. Mm -hmm. Right now, we've only seen four-legged wing Draco lich. That's the classic. And I think it'd be really interesting to see more interpretations of it mm -hmm. with all those different gods, and especially with conflict of interest, like the Chinese dragons. Mm -hmm. Imagine that if it was dra like um, zombified or yeah. Draco lich, right? Um, so I just wanted to hear some thoughts about that sort of thing. Yeah, I, like you said, I think that the possibility would be really interesting, especially if we bring shape-shifting um, yes. into the equation. I think that could be really scary and really cool. Some really good stories and campaigns from that, um, for sure. I think it also, I'd like to see just the no-legged flying version, like the serpentine <laughs> slash jewel would be cool. That's, that's basically the helicopter gunship of the fantasy world, yeah. right? The, <laughs> uh, wing, the, the legless winged flying Draco Lich, yeah. that's just baller <laughs> especially if there's like one of each kind and they're all working yeah. together but i love your i love your shape-shifting idea that you've you know been fighting this lich for you know gosh knows however and he finally drops over at zero hit points and you're like that's done and then he starts <laughs> turning into his real form yeah. of the dragon and you're like oh no why this is only like his second phase there's three more to come right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. it's like a like a caterpillar he goes through stages mm. actually chinese dragons do yeah. so that makes sense there we yeah. go yeah Anyways, that's, I just, that's love it. Right. Thank you. Uh, so for dragons, other than people and other dragons, who do you think are good natural adversaries for dragons, either from mm. the literature or mm. who in mythology would make a good adversary for dragons? <laughs> if you want to tame the dragons, probably too. anyone with a sword, probably, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, uh, classically, they fought elephants and uh, eagles. Those were the great enemies of dragons if you read the uh, Greeks and the Romans, the medieval bestiarists. Um, uh, the, uh, they, they would fight elephants because they craved the cold blood of the elephant. They had hot blood and they wanted to drink its cold blood mm -hmm. to cool themselves down. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's all you want. And the eagles, of course, would go after the young dragons in the nest. Yep. And that's why the dragons and the eagles hated each other. So I would think that like griffins or hippogriffs would be yeah. natural predators right. uh, of dragons. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Last question. I don't even know if you have an answer to this, but you've mentioned crocodiles like 
seven times. Is there an interesting story with the crocodiles or a history of dragons with the crocodiles? A lot of people thought that crocodiles were dragons because that sort of like dragon idea existed before Europeans actually went and saw dragons. So they'd look at a crocodile and be like, oh shit, like that exists, that's a dragon. dragon. That's a dragon. That's basically Mm -hmm. it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I can just recommend Avram Davidson's An Abundance of Dragons. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an essay, one of his adventures in unhistory. And it goes into uh, considerable depth as to the relationship between crocodiles and dragons. Although uh, Davidson, like myself, and like all right-thinking people, says dragons are too big to have one origin story. But he very much thinks that crocodiles are a big part of it. So that will do us for this panel. Where can everyone find you two? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. I'm Good still for you. there. Good as for you. Zarka Emily. Um, also on Instagram at Dr. Emily Zarka and on Storied, the YouTube channel where I have Monstrum. And you can find me on uh, Twitter at Kenneth Height, on Facebook, Kenneth Height, and on uh, my podcast, Ken and Robin Talk About Stuff, uh, wherever you find your podcasts, where we talk about all kinds of stuff, some of it draconic. Awesome. And you can follow the DragonCon Tabletop Track on Twitter at the Table Dragon, or you can follow us on Instagram at DragonCon underscore Tabletop. Also, we would love it if you would follow Cobalt Press, our wonderful sponsor for this year. And one more thing. Okay, you, we also have Master Game Master tomorrow night. You can find barcodes scattered about, and if you are a GM and you want to really like test your chops with some pro GMs giving you uh, feedback, we would love to have you sign on for that. So, scan of barcodes. That's it. Okay.